Uh, so the presentation is called Synchrophaser Analytics Using AI or Machine Learning from Inference at the, at the Edge to Operation Decision Support Application. So we have separated those two contents based on uh, projects that we have been working on in the last uh, couple of years. The first part is going to be me, and I'm going to talk about real-time force oscillation detection at the edge. Uh, this was work I did over the last year, uh, mostly during the summer in Saudi Arabia, um, and the paper is available in this link. And the second part is going to be uh, how should you think about uh, generating synthetic data based on models and simulation for decision-making applications. And this is ongoing work within the Deep Grid project that is uh, funded by uh, the New York State Energy Agency and uh, NIPA. And uh, the previous work is funded by the GridX project, uh, funded by the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. And I want to thank uh, my colleagues in KAUS, Mohammed uh, Ilyas Ayachi and Professor Shehawa Ahmed, and my student Sergio that actually uh, helped us put some of this together. Uh, hopefully in another time we'll show you the wonderful things that Sergio can do. Uh, so uh, real-time force oscillation detection at the edge. Uh, people that has been in NASP meters are familiar with this. So we, uh, yeah, the problem is that we want to identify these force oscillations, first to detect them, then to find the source. So this presentation is focused on first detecting it. They're usually a product of some synchronous control interactions between wind farms and the grid. Here's some real measurements from uh, Oklahoma Gas and Electric uh, that I've been using for a long time now. Uh, if you look at previous work, they are basically signal processing based methods. Uh, um, uh, there is a link there to some of the work I did very recently, no, very a long time ago, starting 2011. But basically, you have this sort of energy band detectors uh, that are, and they look, and you are able to detect, for example, if you are at, uh, uh, if your uh, spectrum shows you that you have a high peak at 12 Hertz, you can calibrate some energy detector through some thresholds. So uh, this is attractive because people has gained some confidence in the method used for mode estimation, but has a lot of disadvantages, for example, there is a lot of inherited delays from the filters. This whole approach is entirely centralized, so you can only use operator decisions. And it really needs a lot of careful parametrization from experts. So it takes some time to understand this, the particular data from the particular location. Uh, so the, uh, the question is, you know, can, can we use AI or machine learning to uh, help evolving requirements? So we want to increase detection speed while maintaining acceptable accuracy on the detection. And we have to train these things using very few data. We don't have so many of these nice cases. So if you look during normal operation, data kind of looks like this during one second. But when the oscillation takes place, it looks like this. And this is quite easy to recognize. But we don't have so much of that data. Uh, we could use simulation results, but it has a limited application, as I will show. And finally, we want to be able to deploy this in the field. We want to make this distributed because it doesn't matter that you detect it only, but you should activate something on that. So the idea of detection at, uh, of machine learning at the edge is that you're going to take a machine learning algorithm that exists or a method or a neural network in this case, and you're going to have a lot of training data that is going to go and train that on trained neural network model. And you need a lot of beefy computer power to do that. So this is the NVIDIA DGX1 cost $100,000, for example. A normal server goes around for 30,000 with a couple of good hardware cards. And at the end, once you have done that training, you can deploy it at the edge. This little control, a uh, little embedded board here is basically doing the detection. This has been trained to recognize cats. So the car drives, it looks at a cat and is able to identify it. And that's basically the approach that we are doing here. So we know that we are looking for, uh, for oscillations. That's our cats. And uh, even though uh, 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 our dog and cat 
pictures look differently. So normally we will see patterns like this. These are our normal operation. They're, these are dogs, but we need to detect cats. And basically what you can do with machine learning is that you take all these bunch of pictures of cats and dogs and you train the neural network. And then you take this picture of a cat and you pass it through the neural network and the output says, yes, it is a cat. So uh, this is the idea. We, we apply a similar approach to find oscillations. That those are our cats. So the approach is as follows. We train using label data, either from measurements or simulations. And the inference is done in real time at the edge from the machine, uh, from the PMU data. So uh, this is the data that we stream. And then we test it against the, uh, uh, is passed to the neural network and it detects, and the training is based on models or simulation. So the next, I don't know, do we, sorry about that. Next slide. So here uh, we use PMU data for this particular application. Uh, uh, we label as normal dogs or oscillation event, and this was all done by hand, and this manually, and it was extremely time consuming. So we have about 26 cases that we use for that. But uh, yeah, if we didn't have PMU data, we can generate it from a model. Uh, we, uh, or tools of choice, language of choice is Modelica and the tool is Daimola. And if we only have a few measurements, like in this case, we combine these two techniques. Uh, uh, so here you see the model. Uh, we have the process or the power system model inside here. And then we configure this model to be able to generate signatures that are very similar to our dogs and cats. So this data over here is labeled as normal and this data over here is labeled as oscillation. And thanks to all of this automation included in the model, we can create different types of uh, uh, data. And this gives us a very big library of pictures for each of these little seconds of data of what is normal and what is an oscillation. And you can see these oscillations are our cats and they look different frequencies, different amplitudes, but they're still the kind of stuff that we need for training. So the training part, we use uh, convolutional neural networks. I'm not gonna talk about the theory of that. <laughs> There's other people that can do it better than me. But basically there are classifiers that have shown outstanding performance in, in pattern recognition. So basically uh, CNN's patterns are learned through translation. So after we learn a shape, we, uh, a, a, a so-called covnet will recognize it anywhere. So the first convolutional layer will uh, uh, learn small local patterns and a second convolutional layer will learn uh, larger patterns and so on until you can learn from the entire picture. To illustrate, you can see here uh, how the input decomposes into different filters that are learned by the network. And here, basically, we show you a map of what uh, of the second convolution layer of what we're using. So finally, we have uh, here a list of different networks that we have uh, two that we have proposed, a two-dimensional one that is similar to AlexNet's architecture. It's very popular uh, architecture. And a, uh, a one-dimensional network. Uh, and so basically we go and we train all of these different networks, the ones that we created, and the ones that uh, exist out there in the literature. And uh, we then run it through some of the real data. And if it predicts that it's normal, it will give us zero. And if it predicts that it's an oscillation, it will give a one. Uh, but you can also see that there are some false positives and some false negatives. So uh, we need to, calculate those to determine the uh, accuracy. And most importantly, we need the time for one prediction because we wanna be as fast as possible. So uh, 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 to understand this, we are trying to look at uh, uh, how to combine the, we have so little measurement data that we need more data to improve the accuracy. So what we do here is that we use the transfer learning approach. So transfer learning allows us to combine the simulation data. In this case, we're almost 2,000 files and uh, uh, about 3,000 files for validation. And inside of here, we have uh, about 
uh, almost a thousand samples or pictures of, of, uh, uh, of the real data. So the average prediction accuracy that is calculated here on the x-axis, you have different transmission lines. So we have a total 73 terminals. And this shows if we train only using with simulation, we will sometimes drop to 88% accuracy, whereas we combine simulation with real data, our accuracy goes up. And finally, here in this other picture, we are comparing our uh, accuracy for the two proposed neural networks uh, with uh, the combination. So we can achieve uh, uh, sufficient accuracy for detection. And finally, I said that we want to put this in a chip device, right? So or, uh, uh, the, here there are all the devices that we used. So you can have an expensive computer with a graphics card. This is old now, but when we were doing it, this was top of the line at 1080 Ti. Uh, this costs $3,000 and it has a time for one prediction of 0 0.0049 seconds or uh, 0 0.20022 seconds for this. If we go down to the NVIDIA Xavier uh, uh, over here, this is used, for example, for autonomous vehicles. Uh, it costs $700, but uh, you know it has less power in the GPU, in the graphical processing unit. So the uh, time to one prediction increases, but it's still at the uh, millisecond level. And finally, you can buy these cheap ones called the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you know, with all the add-ons that you need to run the thing is less than $100 and it gives us a half a second accuracy. Uh, so that's really promising. And here is a little video that shows you the thing actually working. So uh, here we will inject an oscillation. And here is the prediction happen instantly. So this is tested using real time. Now we will go and change the prediction and uh, change the, the, the input as an oscillation and is detected automatically. Okay, so this is available on my YouTube channel if you want to watch it with detail. Uh, uh, what are the key takeaways that I can offer you for this part? Uh, you can do this kind of advanced uh, uh, applications like force detection oscillation is fast and accurate and it can be deployed at the edge but requires good data. Uh, not all the data is created equal. That means that uh, unless you have the behavior that you want in the data set, uh, uh, it doesn't matter even if, uh, if you have terabytes of data, you need to have the, the behavior. So here is where labeling is a key. It's very time consuming and requires expert knowledge. So it's not really easy to tell apart a cat from a dog when you only have seen uh, two dogs and two cats. Uh, so you need a, a common curated data set that can be shared for development. Uh, regarding methods and models, there is so much development available. And what we need to do really from my perspective is not invent a new kind of machine learning algorithm, but adapt them. Uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Please don't do that. Let's use common tools. This will enable portability and reuse. So for example, using TensorFlow, Keras, and PyTorch, this is used by a gigantic number of people. If we can learn how to adapt those mechanisms, we can reuse all of that infrastructure. Transfer learner is extremely useful, but accuracy improvements, so if you use only simulation data, you will get some acceptable results. But if you want good accuracy, you need real world created data. And finally, there's a, you know, there's a great potential for these little devices that cost 30 bucks to add capabilities to existing control and automation uh, equipment. Uh, but we need to, uh, the infrastructure, the hardware to train at scale. And we need the data and that. And that's uh, cost prohibitive. So a uh, shared platform will be really needed going forward for this. Uh, the next uh, part is Tatiana's part. Tatiana, should I work with your slides or should I, uh, or do you want to take control of the slides? Uh, I would like to share my slides. I think it would be faster then. Okay, go ahead. I, st I have to stop. Hmm.
while Tatiana is uh, getting set up, let me just uh, thank Luigi. And I, I want to tie this back really to the need uh, for the national infrastructure for AI, because what you've seen here are some really sophisticated ways uh, of using data and a lot of you know, other technologies building on top of it, but underlying it still is the need for, uh, for good input data and the flexibility to work with it and really play with it. Uh, we're running a little short on time, but uh, Tatiana, over to you. I see your screen. Yeah, okay. So uh, I, I would like to tell uh, uh, about the uh, first part of a uh, deep grip project, which dedicated to uh, uh, data generation for a recommender system that we're going to develop uh, to recommend to operator uh, which action to take in order to uh, do reliability enhancement. So, uh, um, as Luigi said before, that uh, real data not always contain uh, all the required dynamics of the system. So we need to do a synthetic simulation of the data in order to feed to neural network and uh, do uh, machine learning. So uh, I propose to um, use um, graph theory and uh, uh, probability theory in order to uh, do automatic uh, uh, data uh, generation. So if we, uh, 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 so the idea is to receive trajectories uh, of power system signals like magnitudes uh, and angles uh, after contingency in order to give to neural network enough data to uh, learn. Uh, the graph theory is useful in order to detect change in uh, of topology of the system after contingency and verify if the generation is still present after uh, faults uh, uh, or not, uh, or uh, if the graph is still connected and preserves uh, uh, the behavior of the whole system or it is already islanded. Uh, so the algorithm we developed uh, uh, is, uh, contains several steps. Uh, first, we start with uh, a sampling number of elements of contingency. Those elements are generators, transformers, or line trips. Um, then uh, we choose uh, uniformly one of those elements and we start, uh, continue with checking the connectedness uh, or presence of generation after the contingency if uh, the element is only one. Uh, if, it is, uh, if there is a, a chain of elements in the contingency, we go uh, to the loop where we sample the distance between previous and next elements. Uh, those sampling uh, relies on real uh, data and historical data I show later. So um, just on this slide, uh, adjacency matrix and Laplacian matrix, uh, they are used from graph theory in order to identify a generation and uh, define number of islands. Uh, those who are interested can check. So, the ideas of uh, uh, from which distribution to sample are uh, borrowed from historical data. For example, to uh, sampling of number uh, elements uh, uh, of the contingency follows the uh, geometric distribution uh, according to the data released uh, uh, by Western Electricity Coordinating Council. Um, they released frequency of outages uh, depending on number of elements. Uh, the same uh, distribution, but with another coefficients, uh, um, is valid for uh, it, uh, uh, sampling the distance between uh, the next elements uh, according uh, with respect to previous element. Um, so. This is the example. Uh, when we first uh, trip uh, the line, 
we need to identify the longest path uh, to the uh, more distant element in order to feed to the function uh, we use for uh, uh, estimation of the uh, uh, PDF. And uh, that coefficient equal to six we uh, identified from the uh, historical data. And then uh, we uh, uh, sampling this probability uh, density function uh, tells us uh, what's the probability of the next element being located uh, closer or more distant from the previous contingency element. So uh, as we see uh, on the graph that which is logical from the power system uh, perspective that the closest element uh, to the previous uh, uh, contingency element is more um, a probable to be a tripped next. Uh, so then after uh, generation of, the, uh, of that data with contingencies and uh, tra trajectories, what we receive, we uh, label with, uh, for example, a small signal stability index. Uh, if we analyze small signal, uh, doing a small signal stability analysis. Um, and this uh, thing is um, widely known uh, in power system communities, so I won't stop. So take aw takeaways from uh, what we've been doing is that uh, data generation is time consuming and it is uh, also data extraction pre-processing uh, and uh, normalization for a particular machine learning pipeline it takes 50, 80% of your time. Then uh, you have to be careful what you give for, to the model to learn, uh, really defines uh, the output. So if we don't have all the dynamics uh, we want system to know, uh, to learn, uh, it will not give a good uh, result on real data then. Uh, then um, we have to use real data directly or indirectly. In this case, we used uh, historical data in order to uh, identify distributions. And then tools are important, as Luigi said before, that we use Modelica and it uh, gives full access uh, to just parameters. And uh, we parallelize our simulations. So we do multi-core computing uh, uh, GPU computing for machine learning and Python. And uh, this is uh, the table of uh, uh, the speed of data generation. And uh, so you can see that if we do really big data generation, it takes hours. So that's it from my side. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Tatiana.